Yes, so today I'm not going to speak about performance, so I know that uh, maybe you will be slightly disappointed. Um, I want to, to focus more on the way that we can uh, integrate a high performance storage system in a larger solution. So since I know that you're addicted to it, I will still speak a bit about performance. So looking at the very bottom of a storage system, the media where we are storing the data, in few years, we've seen a huge improvement. So maybe five to six years ago, our drive were really the basic of a file, file system and the performance has been quite considerably improved with the SSD and the SSD has only been like I will say, uh, a small window of time and no NVMe is ubiquitous and so the performance of a single NVMe is something like 20 times faster than the hard drive. So the storage media is really much much faster and the question is that I've have we been able, as a community, to build storage solution, leveraging this huge improvement we've seen from the uh, electronic uh, components? So as most of us, in order to get information about high performance storage solution, I go to IO500. So this list is published twice per year uh, at uh, Supercomputing on ISC. And it's tracking, basically, the, the fastest the storage uh, system deploy either in a lab or in a production on Earth. So it's very convenient to to really see what is going on at the edge of, of our community in terms of performance. So talking about bandwidth, which will be uh, the discussion for the next uh, couple of slides, there is two different uh, type of bandwidth in IO500, the easy and the hard one. So easy read and easy write means simple I.O. pattern on the opposite hard read and hard write with more complicated random I.O. pattern. What is interesting here is not just to look about the raw performance number, but the ratio between this easy and hard. So for instance, the fastest, the, the one who gets the highest uh, uh, rank, the number one, so it's a weak I.O. running on uh, cloud. So you, we can see that there is uh, around 300 gigabytes per sec in terms of bandwidth for the easy case. And for the hard case, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, there is uh, maybe on the average only 100 uh, gigs. So it's like one third of efficiency. And if you go to line number four, so the Tiani uh, 2E system, the bandwidth is much larger, 600 for the easy case, but for the right case, uh, it's a bit more complicated. So I would say that what is interesting uh, for me here is that this NVMe, they have high bandwidth, bytes uh, addressable, no mechanical part to move. So are we able to build efficient file system out of it? So this slide, so I'm not super proud of it, but this is the best I was able to make. So I try looking at the fastest top five uh, system in the IO500, I, I try to, to compute some kind of efficiency metric. So basically I took the uh, hard uh, bandwidth and I divided by the, the easy bandwidth. So 100% means that this is perfectly balanced. And what we see over here is that some all the fastest system in the, the most efficient system in 2017 was around 70% of bandwidth of efficiency. And then for the two, three, uh, number two and number three, it was around 20%, and then it was going quite down. And what we had in uh, uh, 2019 at ISC, it was basically the the disappearance, the disappearance. I don't know if it's really English of the uh, pure hard drive based system. So the last 100% hard drive based system was in the list for the top five uh, position was at ISC uh, uh, 2019. And the efficiency was extremely low, as you can see, like it was in the range of 1%. However, the system was so large that even with being sub-efficient for the hard case, it was delivering uh, a super high bandwidth for the easy case on overall it was ranked first. And now six months later, so last November, 
what we see is that we have the first system, it's the Intel-based DAOs, I believe, which is able to deliver uh, the same bandwidth independently of the I.O. pattern. So you can throw I.O. 500 hard or I.O. 500 easy, you will get the exact same bandwidth. And then for the other guys, so it was not as good as six months ago. However, I will say on the average, efficiency is increasing. So my point here would be that Yes, it's not perfect, but we have been able to build much uh, more reliable and efficient storage systems thanks to the NVMe uh, device. So, or, uh, and furthermore, as a, a storage vendor, I will auto uh, uh, grant me with a, a, not a gold medal, but a, a good grade. Yes, we've been able to build a significantly better systems thanks to this uh, new device. So it means that if you are, you are just looking for bandwidth, even uh, hard I.O. pattern, it's no longer uh, a scientific issue, not even an engineering one. It's mostly a question about uh, deployment. So we can deploy a multi-terabyte system. We do this not every day, sadly, but quite often uh, around the world uh, during the year. So we know to do this, it's no longer uh, a tough problem. So it's kind of a personal uh, point of view, but I think the, the bandwidth issue has been mostly resolved. So this uh, uh, next slide is also a bit personal. So I would say that from a technical uh, view and scientific point of view, if the bandwidth is issue is closed, I would think that now the difficult task that we have ahead of us is dealing with latency. So having this super fast uh, NVMe device, so this is a pie chart on the right, has allowed to shrink the cost of the storage media to something almost negligible, like maybe 15% of the cost of an IO now is due to the media and 85% is due to the software stack. On the hard drive, uh, level so when we are still running even with fast hard drive the the software was negligible on 95 percent of the cost was on the media so it means that now if you want to address um, the latency issue the problem has become much more diverse because it's a software project but with very different kind of things that we have to go through so i think that most of the effort now has to be retargeted to the software part of the storage solution and this is why probably you see Spectrum Scaler V5, uh, Exascaler V5, and all these new startups who are trying to bring innovation into this software uh, ecosystem. So what we can say is that we have new media. They have ex been extremely successful in order to uh, allow people to build a better system. Are we able to build solutions which are not fully NVMe based? So is there, is there some kind of interoperability at the medium, uh, at the media level within a, a storage solution? The answer is yes. So taking into uh, example what we are doing in uh, Luster, so the exa 5 uh, system at uh, DDN, there is a notion of hot pool where part of the file system has been accelerated thanks to NVMe, not just the metadata part, but the, the data part. And this NVMe uh, pool is able to accelerate the, either the ingestion or also the emission of data. And using data locality, tempor temporal locality, the data are moving up and down into these two storage layers, the NVMe hot pools and the cold pool uh, which is built on a uh, hard drive. So uh, yes, we have been able to articulate solution um, using these two kinds of media. So can we go a bit further, can we be a bit more aggressive? So this one is, uh, I would say, some all taking over this point on the importance of software layer. So yes, we can also articulate solution which are 100% NVMe based. And we try to resolve or to address the cost of software by not implementing a full file system. So this is what we are doing with Burst Buffer. So you have this at HPE, you have this at DGN, and you have this for uh, other vendors also. Whereas the idea is that 
we provide the thinner possible software layer in order to expose most of the uh, hardware performance. But then we do not provide the full feature set of a file system. And then we try to articulate this burst buffer with a full file system. So this is also a way to, uh, I would say, have interoperable uh, storage solution using both NVMe and hard drive. And we can go also a bit further. So this is jumping into the cloud. So what can we do when not everything is running on premise, which is going to be more and more the case nowadays where HPC centers tend to open up. So opening uh, a data center is not that obvious because we have to deal with some um, not administrative burden, but with some hard fact. So the first one is the latency. So I'm not very good scientist, but I know that speed of light is difficult to, to beat. And if you look at uh, one meter of uh, optic fiber, even with uh, the, the perfect substrate, you cannot go uh, faster than the speed of light. You need three nanoseconds to, uh, to cross one meter of length. So it means that if your data is one meter away from the processing unit, you have at least to spend three nanoseconds. And if you look at the current throughput in terms of uh, floating point operation of our processing units nowadays, so taking a GPU uh, V100, for instance, in three nanoseconds, you can already do a few hundred thousand uh, floating point operation. So, of course, I'm playing a bit with the numbers here, but the idea is that if you do not take into account the data locality, the special locality, physically where your data are stored in respect of your processing unit, it's going to be extremely difficult to deliver an efficient solution. So next slide. So this one is a bit more uh, um, science fiction, or I don't know, let's say extrapolation. So I've tried to compute what is the weight, the physical weight of data. So going through the, uh, the various product data sheet and so on, I arrived to the conclusion that Today, in, in 2020, if I want to store four petabytes of data, I will probably end up with a rack full of hardware weighing one metric ton. So this idea is that you have one metric ton, and I want somehow to squeeze this into a single wire. It's going to be difficult. And this is also the reality that we have in data center. It's at some point, we are caught by the, the weight, the amount of data to, to ship. On moving petabytes of data, it's not trivial. Even if theoretically everything could work, in practice, there is many things which make it uh, something quite difficult and uh, painful. And one uh, of the answers of the community has been the Amazon Snowball product, where basically they ship you a suitcase full of hard drive. You store the data into the device, and then you physically ship, thanks to FedEx, uh, the device to the next uh, data center. So. I think it's acknowledged the difficulty of moving data through the internet, a massive amount of data. So maybe I can skip this one because time is running. So now the question is that knowing that it's for this physical reason, it's difficult to move data from my uh, local data center to the cloud, or do I orchestrate in a smart way the data movement? So there is one thing also which is uh, interesting is that uploading data is free. So Amazon is not going to charge if I upload one petabyte of data into their data center, which is obvious because basically I'm adding value to their, to their cloud. So it's, it's free of charge. However, bringing data back out of the cloud is a, um, as a cost. So I have to pay for this, for the amount of gigabyte uh, downloaded. So it means that First thing is that what I want to bring back is only dirty data, dirt data which has been modified by the computation in the cloud or not bring back my whole data set where only few bytes have been modified. So here it's collided a bit with a very notion of object because object is supposed to be immutable. So if I modify one byte in an immutable object, if the object is large, I will have a large write amplification. And at the end, the new version of the object that I will try to bring back home will be large, even if only a single byte has been modified. So somehow, in order to limit the amount of data that 
that I want to bring back from the cloud to my local uh, uh, HPC center, I need a, a way to track dirty byte. So this is what we are proposing with a uh, uh, IME, which has a built-in copy on write, but any copy on write system will be, uh, works the same. With copy on write, you only do download the data which has been written. So you're saving a lot of bandwidth in respect of downloading the whole data set. There is another thing which is important as well in the cloud is that uh, the storage, the network, pardon me, is not as clean as we have on-premise. So already uh, within the data center network, uh, the network fabric is always complicated to, to maintain, but in the cloud, you can have huge uh, fluctuation in terms of performance. So it's quite important to have quality of service uh, uh, system. And this is what we try to provide uh, as well with IME where we have some way to adapt if a network link or server seems to be less responsive than the other one. So part of the traffic is, is uh, retargeted to a most performing server. And going to the cloud, it's not only my data center going to my cloud provider, but it will be probably, and at least this is what we are seeing in the field, um, being a constellation of various cloud discussing with the local data center. So it means that we, we need to have a, a way to manage data across several cloud instances, probably for not the same provider. So this is what we, we try to, to, to provide with uh, the new version of uh, our Luster system, where there is many connectors and there is also software components uh, dedicated to the synchronization of data between uh, the local storage and the cloud. So it's named FileSync and CloudSync. And this is something which I believe is going to be really important. It's, it's not impacting the performance at all. It's just to ease the way that we are building our workflow nowadays. So somehow, uh, this is a very uh, a crude picture of what could be, uh, I will say, a cloud-ready installation where you have the big iron appliance running in the data center. So it would be like the, the scalar thing at the bottom. This is hardware plus uh, software co-design, both of it running locally. And then we have uh, a software solution dispatched in the cloud. So here it will be the uh, IME, which is a software-defined storage able to adapt to the network fluctuation and only um, uh, write down to the local data center the interesting uh, byte on keeping the clean uh, the clean byte uh, into the cloud, and this will be able to run the application uh, in the cloud. And my, one of my last slide here, it's just to, to mention this is not uh, I will say a, a theoretical uh, exercise. It's, it's very true that modern uh, work, uh, workflow are complicated, and somehow they will excite all, uh, all the edges of this uh, graph of, of data flow. So taking into, um, as an example the autonomous vehicle, there are several phases in the process, and one of the phases would be like brutal, the car arrive, and then you need to uh, extract all the data from the car in, in order to bring it to the data center. So this is a pure bandwidth uh, things. And then out of this data, we are going to perform uh, some pre-processing and then we are going to apply um, deep learning and then simulation of a part of the data. So there is a whole data life cycle and each, each phase is the IO pattern will be completely uh, different on the best way, the optimized way, both in terms of performance and cost, um, in, to, to solve this, uh, this phase, to address the problem is going to be different. It will be on-premise in the cloud and things like that. So we have really to think in terms of complexity and not just IO kernel as we, we used to do. So that would be like the, the nice uh, marketing things where uh, we try to uh, orchestrate the various uh, data silo and uh, using synchronization, but still at the at believe that we will still need uh, big iron fast storage within the data center at HPC. Uh, we would still have to uh, 
uh, to keep our notion of data center. It's not going to disappear uh, anytime soon. Okay, so that will be my conclusion for today. <laughs>